and the ones you predestined you called the ones you called you justified and the ones you justified you glorified so we can say we will live the glorified life of the son of God that gave himself for us father we worship you because we know that when we have that life no darkness can overshadow us because the first Adam we're told was made a living being but that second and final Adam that Jesus came in the capacity of is a life-giving spirit and so we thank you for that life oh God it's a life that is already more than a conqueror because it is guaranteed in your love Father, we give you praise in the mighty name of Jesus. Let's be seated. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right, all right. God is good. Okay. Just, um, all right. So that was in me. All right, God is good. So first of all, I want to welcome Brother Don. Don Brown, good to see you again. Hallelujah. And, you know, the Brown family, Brother Don, his wife and their son, um, wouldn't miss a meeting back in the day when they were still in Atlanta. And even though they're not physically here, okay, it, do I need to stand in a particular place? What's going on? I, I hear so much echo. So, um, so just let me know. All righty, God is good. Even though they're several miles away now, or hundreds and hundreds of miles away, they are still very close. And I just want to say that for everybody to know that we appreciate y'all. We thank God for your support, you know, for carrying us along with the things that God is doing in your life over there and for staying abreast of what things are going on here. Um, you're a great soldier. We appreciate you greatly. God bless you, sir. Hallelujah. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Tonight... I've got a couple of um, announcements to make, but they're not announcements about events and activities and all whatnot. They're just um, watchmen kind of announcements. Um, yeah, because I think it's time we, we knew of what's going to follow. You understand what I mean? Uh, because many of us have had the privilege by the grace of God of telling Alrighty, um, do I need to change the mic? I really just, I don't sound like me. I feel like I'm listening to somebody else. So um, if I need to change this mic, I'm quite happy to. What can we do? What else, what is missing? What's, not, what's unusual today? And it might just be my, my monitor, Emmanuel. Maybe it's just me. Everyone might be hearing me okay. Can you guys hear me good? Okay, so it must be my monitor then. I just, there's just, um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I think Emmanuel is nodding like he's got it. All righty, God is good. So, on the 5th of September, we had a video that we posted about a war that was coming. Do you all remember that? And so that must have been from the message of the 3rd or the 4th. Because we, we post the videos two days or, or sometimes just the day after the teaching itself. I think we're good now. We're golden. That is excellent. So it was September 4th. That was the day of the prophecy. And then on the 5th, we posted the, the video. And thank God for Alan, because I think it was a 90-minute message. And that snippet was perhaps, what, all of one, hour, one minute and 30 seconds, thereabouts. But the beauty of it was I saw the video. I mean, by the grace of God, I was here when the prophecy came forth. And I saw the video and didn't think much about it until the war started. And when the war started, my brother called me and he said, so what do you think? Where do you stand on all of what's going on? There's so much, you know, conflicting opinions out here. What do you think? And I told him exactly what the Lord had revealed to me and I just shared that with him. And he was like, okay, I hear you. And then a couple of days later, he found the video. And then he sent it to me and called me and he says, why did you engage me in all that long conversation? You could have just sent me this video. All of 90 seconds. And it would have been clearer than all of what you were trying to explain. And I said, well, I kind of assumed you had seen the video and I wanted to elaborate. 
But it was like that was not needed. That 90 seconds, I've been sending it to my friends. That 90 seconds was enough. And I'm thankful to God because we're better now or we're doing better with prophetic words than we were. You know, when COVID came, God gave us the, the, the heads up. I prophesied about it. The clearest prophecy that I gave about COVID was on the 11th of, of January, 2020, including the lockdown, including the part that the news was going to play, the fear that was going to be propagated in the news and all of that stuff. And when I listened to the prophecy again, the recorded piece, the entire message was two hours and five minutes. I will not forget. When I listened to everything again, I, re I then noticed that somewhere along the line, I stopped what I was saying and I said, the Lord will have us share this for others to know. I felt really bad. I was, I was so sorry because we didn't do a good job at sharing the video. In fact, if anything at all, for weeks, we didn't even post that video. And when we posted the video of the entire service, there was no title, there was nothing. We just put a date on it. It wasn't until later that people were hearing in the news that folks were saying, but this was what you prophesied. This was what you said. And then we dug it up and tried to create like a five-minute clip out of it. But by then... It was maybe not too late is the word. It, was, it could have been more effective in the lives of other people had we done it just the way the Lord said. And so I know that we've been doing a lot better, but we still can do better than we're doing now. There is a level of faithfulness and commitment to the prophetic that is needed to be exercised by us, especially to those of us who get to receive it receive the prophetic utterances firsthand. And the reason why I'm saying that is because there are places that I have been and there are things that I have seen. And I know that heaven is not miserly when it comes to letting us know what is about to happen. There are angels whose assignments constitutes primarily of letting us know the things that have been approved by the Father for us to know. The word of God says, God himself speaking, will I do a thing without, first of all, revealing it to my servants, the prophets? One of the things that I said on the 4th of September while I was here prophesying about the war was not to, I didn't just describe the nature of the principality behind the war. I also expressed very clearly as the Holy Spirit gave me utterance, the motif the outcome, and also the posture that the believers who hear me need to take. I did say in there that do not let anyone compel you to say this or that, specifically because of the fact that a lot of what is being arrayed before us and a lot of what is being orchestrated around us is for the sole purpose of getting us to say things. Let us not forget the Bible says that out of the mouth of babes and suckling, the Lord has ordained strength. And if you're wondering who the babes and the sucklings are, whenever David was talking about children, babes, and sucklings, he, he, he would use that, you know, poetic, um, he would use that as a way of, they call it poetic license, but he used it as a way of creating a contrast between us and the angels. Whenever he talks about the ancient ones, he's talking about the beings of the first day. He's talking about the beings that were made the day the Lord said, let there be light. Because they came into being essentially before there was the separation of the light from the darkness, before the clock started ticking. So a lot of them came into existence carrying with them an essence of eternity. And that is why they are called the ancient. And when he attends the meetings of the ancient because it was someone that was very frequent in the presence of God. And I, I want to talk to us a little bit also today about being frequent in the presence of God. David spent so much time in the presence of God that there were times wherein they didn't get him to leave the room until certain meetings began. Because he was always there. You know those people that are always around? Sometimes they're like, can you please excuse us? We need to have a meeting. And then they'll excuse you. And after a while, you don't care anymore because it's like, he's, he's, he's always here. So you might as well say what you want to say. 
So on one of those occasions, David was in heaven. He was in the presence of God. And, and, and a particular order of the ancient, they came to God because they were very puzzled at how much attention God was given to the sons and daughters of men. Because remember that God is the father of all spirits and the God of all flesh. So we are not the only ones that he is responsible for. The Bible says, God speaking, I have sheep in other fold. Even though this existence is very key to the scheme of salvation and to the plan of God for all of creation, because even beings that are outside of our realm have to keep an eye on what is going on in here because the word of God says for the earnest expectation of all of creation eagerly waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. We might seem infinitesimal. We might seem like we got here only yesterday, but God has given us the privilege of his favor. And so everyone pays attention to what is going on in here and should pay attention to what is going on here. And so you've got eternal beings, beings who are eternals, who are the ancient ones, having a thought among themselves that why is the father always talking about earth? Sometimes you're trying to get his attention, but he's not even looking at you. He just says, keep talking. Because the Bible says that God's attention is where? He's on the earth. The eye of the Lord runs to and fro upon the earth. And you know that we are made in his image and in his likeness. God is not a cyclope. So it's not like he has one eye in the middle of his face. The reason why the Bible says the eye of the Lord, that expression eye, when you, have been, when you are describing the actions or the activities of a being with two eyes and you use a singular noun instead of the two eyes, you just say eye, you're talking about the person's focus. That was why Jesus, let, Jesus says, let your eye be single. You understand what I mean? And that is the reason why cameras have only one lens. Because focus is very critical to snapping photographs. Focus is very critical for making sense out of the many wondrous things that are going on around you. Remember that we are multidimensional beings, and if we do not know the art of focus, we will confuse things that are happening across the spectrum of the dimensions that we participate in. An example that I give to us is there are times wherein you have sickness in your body, but your spirit is fine because your spirit cannot be inflicted. For inflictions or afflictions happen only in your flesh. You understand what I mean? The Bible says that the outward man perishes, but the inward man is renewed day by day. Every single day, your spirit is brand new. And so if you have sickness in your body, and you, and you know that in the spirit you have been made whole, if you don't know how to adjust your focus to where your strength is coming from, you could be confessing health in one minute, and in the next minute you're confessing death doubt you can be confessing by faith that I by his stripes I am healed and in the next minute you're like oh this illness is probably going to kill me that is the reason why we need focus because what we see is what what we focus on is what we magnify and what you magnify at the end of the day is what occupies your heart and out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks so if you're not if your focus is dented then your conversation is going to be also dented and that is the reason why when God was being referenced as focusing on the earth, the Bible says the eye of the Lord runs to and fro upon the earth seeking for those whose minds are stayed on him. Now you're thinking about the man that was made yesterday and that lives only but for a moment. From the perspective of those who have lived forever, they think about us as living only for just a moment. You know, the, you're here today and you're gone tomorrow. They're not impressed. You understand what I mean? They're not. I mean, even Adam would not be impressed with us. He lived 900 and maybe, what, 60 years? Thereabouts, or 926, something almost unbelievable like that. But they came to God and said, What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you should visit him. Now, the guys who were talking were people of significance, potency, and authority. And yet they had reasons. 
to question why God is so vested in us. Why is he so in to us? You see, let me just quickly say this before I continue. When my wife came up here to pray today, she was like, I don't set a timer for myself on how long I'm going to be praying for. I pray until I feel the release, until I know that I have been heard, and also until I have heard. And while she was saying all of that, I was here screaming my head off and shouting just because things like that sound like music to my soul. Not just because it's coming from my wife, but because it's coming from a kingdom agent who has the kind of dedication that is expected as good soldiers of the cross. You see, and when she said that, I also thought about the fact that somebody may think that I'm screaming and shouting because Nigerians are loud. You know, I've heard that before. You know, someone said to me many years ago, in this country, you know, I was really excited about being in the presence of God. I could feel the presence of God. I knew that the presence of God was tangible in the place, and I was excited and expressing myself. And it was like, oh, you Nigerians, you know how to do it. Yeah, but you guys can be loud. And I was, at first I was like, uh, do I say thank you? Or do I, what do I do? So I, I finished my shouting. And then I said to him, I said, that wasn't the Nigerian. That was Zion shouting. I said, because I'm shouting the way you shout when you're watching football. Because the reason why people shout when they're watch, watching football is because they have already taken sides and they have invested in that side. You have invested time and you have also invested money in buying the memorabilia. You have invested affection and adoration. You know sometimes the way I see people adore their favorite football players? I'm like, I guarantee you some of these people can almost ask Jesus to stand up so that their players can sit down. <laughs> oh, that, that, that might sound like an exaggeration, but I've seen people who have never been half as excited about the presence of God as they are about a team that hardly wins. We're not going to be mentioning the names today because I see new people and I don't want to, you know, first impressions matter. I don't want them to think that I am not into their club or into their team. But you see, that's exactly the reason why I wasn't going to mention names. Not even for the new people, even for Shannon and for Cody, you know. But then at the end of the day, the reason why you feel the need. See, when I'm watching football, people come to my house, you know, every now and again when there's a Super, a super Bowl. I nearly said Supernatural Bowl. But when, <laughs> when there is Super Bowl, people come. And I'm excited to serve people, excited to entertain people, because as soon as the game is over, we're going to have a short prayer meeting. You can't just come and have popcorn and go home and barbecue. I didn't do all that work just so that you can watch the game. Okay? So all of you that have come to my house for Super Bowl, when I tell you oh, I'm hosting Super Bowl, I, you, you know why I'm doing it. I do it for the fellowship. Yeah, the prayer meeting. Oh, no, no, no. The other day, so, you know, the Falcons lost and the gentleman was so angry, he wanted to walk away. I said, this is even more of a reason why we should sing a couple of worship songs. <laughs> I don't want to send you home looking this sad and disgruntled. So why don't we just begin to give thanks to God? We have to have fellowship one way or the other because we are of the order of Obed Edom. We have to seek every opportunity we have in serving other people in the name of God's presence. So if you don't know what I mean, go and look for a man in the Bible. His name is Obed-Edom. His name means the one who serves other men. And he did so simply because he cherishes the presence of God so much, he wanted everybody to benefit from it. And so they would come and watch the game, and the entire time I'm watching people scream, but I am not screaming. I'm not getting excited because the reason why people get excited is because they're he got to see something happen or they're afraid that something might happen so they begin to show emotions. But I have no stake in what's going on. So when you come to God's presence and you find it difficult to get excited, to scream and to shout, it's usually an indication of you needing to invest a little bit more in that presence. You see, 
when you see people that fast and pray and intercede for others, whenever there's an opportunity to gather together like this in the presence of God to pray, they scream, they shout, because they know who exactly they are rooting for. Because we have invested so much in singing this kingdom, established in the hearts of all and sundry, that whenever there is an opportunity to push back the gates of hell, even if it's just by a mile, we will do it with so much glee and with so much zest because we are vested. Because we have been with the one who is also what? Invested. Because God has been investing in us from time immemorial. Even though the ancient do not understand it, even though the angels may question it, the reality of it is God has proposed in his heart to allow for his glory to find one resting place and one, re one resting place alone. And that is on humanity. That's why he made us in his image and in his likeness so that it, it, it fits perfectly. We're not sharing the glory. We're just hosting the glory. You know, there's a difference because some people, God has given them the privilege of hosting the glory. And after a while, because of familiarity, which breeds contempt, they begin to feel like the glory belongs to them, whereas the reality of it is, no, 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 only God, to God alone, be the glory. And he will not share his glory with any man. And so God wants to give more to us. And the reason why I started saying all of that was because I was telling you that there are places that I have been in and there are things that I have seen, and I know that there are angels who are committed to divulging what exactly the Lord God Almighty has authorized for us to know and one of those things in particular that God wants us to know per time are the things that are about to happen by the hand of God, such that by the time it's in the news is already stale news to you. You know, I say jokingly that they call it news, but it's not new. It shouldn't be new to you. You know, I feel, sometimes I feel like how do I even explain this? When I hear something of significance in the news and it's new to me, it makes me wonder what meetings in heaven I may have missed. It makes me wonder because this is my privilege by God. The Bible says God has chosen to reveal these things to us and to our children. We didn't pay for it. We didn't earn it. It's a privilege that he gave to us. The least we can do is enjoy it. You know how we are when we're trying to get our children to eat? They didn't work for that food. They didn't pay for that food. You paid for it. The least they can do is at least eat it because it's good for them. You know how you feel when they're not eating those vegetables? Especially when they pretend to be eating it and the moment you turn around, they toss it on the table. That is the worst. And that is what many of us do. We come before the Lord and the word of God is being dished out. Prophetic utterances are coming forth and you're there like, hmm, prophesy. Hmm, my God. You're pretending to be taking it in, but what you're doing it is you're shoving it under the table because if you're truly eating it, it should reflect in your radiance. <laughs> the reality of it is that every single one of us was supposed to be like Christ. Jesus says, as I am, so are you. He says, the things that I do are the things that I see my father do. The things that I say are the ones that I hear my father say. If that was the way Jesus operated, why should we operate any less? He paid with his own life so that we can be grandfathered into that position. It was because Jesus gave his life that we can now be inside of him, seated at the right hand of the father. And if truly I, I am in Christ Jesus at the right hand of the Father, then nothing should be hidden from me. But then again, God has a balance, something to balance it. He wants to reveal everything to you and I. In fact, the reality of it is this. Paul gave us an insight. He told us that everything that has ever happened, everything that is happening and everything that will ever happen, happen has been compressed together encoded and inseminated into each and every one of us. The Bible says that eternity is written into the hearts of men. Why did God do that? 
Because I asked him, I said, okay, why? Why did you do that? Because I still want to know what's going to happen. I want to know what happened before. And he said to me, you can only hear what you have. If I do not have any French in me, if I don't have French language inside of me, and Tia comes and starts speaking French to me, it will be like noise. Because I do not have anything within me that resonates with what is coming from her. So in order for God to guarantee that he can communicate with us and share with us mysteries of life, he needed to have first of all inscribed the vocabulary for existence and life into each and every one of us. And heaven has a name for that particular script. It is called a measure of faith. Hmm. Alan, can you do me a solid and just increase that music a little bit? Just a tad if you can. You see, the measure of faith, why? Because the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. So if there is no measure of faith within you, there's no deep calling the deep. So everything is inside of you. This well of living water is where? Is inside of you. And Jesus is saying, you don't need to die of thirst. Neither do you need to wander looking for water. You can always tap from within you out of that reserve. And the beauty of it is it's not just a reservoir. It is a fountain that is connected to a source that is unto everlasting life. And so that means you and I, we have everything that pertains to life and godliness. We have everything that we need and everything that we will ever need. And that is the reason why at times it breaks the heart of God when we are living our lives like scavengers, going from crusade to crusade, from conference to conference, going from one book to the other, seeking that which is not lost because it is inside of you. We just need the art of attentiveness. We need to learn what it means to be able to sit at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ like Mary did and allow all the noise to fizzle out so that we can hear what the spirit of the Lord is saying to the churches, to the ecclesia. So I want to encourage you folks, do not hurry out from the presence of God. Why would you stand? Do you know who said that? Solomon. Solomon says, do not hurry from the presence of the king. Why must you stand in an evil place? That is because he grew up with a man who considered every atmosphere that lacks the presence of God an evil place. And that was the reason why David had people that were full-time singers and full-time musicians. He put them on the payroll of the palace. Because he did not want for a second for there not to be singing unto the Lord. Because he has come to know that any atmosphere or place that is not the presence of God is an evil place. We don't have to like it, but it is reality. Everywhere there is no light is what? Darkness. Darkness. Everywhere there is no light is darkness. Darkness itself is not an entity that can exist without reference to light. What we call darkness is simply the absence of light. Because the moment light begins to shine, darkness what? Disappears. And so we don't have to like the way it sounds. Someone is like, well, couldn't there be a neutral place like a DMZ? <laughs> Like a demilitarized zone. A place where, what if I don't want God today? Yeah, what if I don't want, I just want to be, I just want me. No, the moment you do not have life, what you have is death. The moment you do not have light, what you have is darkness. Because Jesus made it very clear that there are no middle grounds. He said, if the light in you be darkness, he says, how deep is that darkness? So there needs to be light in you and you need to be in light all the time. We cannot overemphasize the need for us to be in God's presence. 
We get better at everything that we do consistently. If you are consistent at spending time in the presence of God, talking back to him, not talking back at him, but talking to him, spending time learning how to listen for his voice, you will get better at hearing what he has to say. You will become accustomed to getting excited whenever God is on the move because God is about to have a touchdown on the behalf of your brother and sister. It doesn't have to be on your behalf in that particular instance, but as long as it's a win for one, it's a win for all. So when I'm in the presence of God, I'm excited all the time because I hear God telling me stuff about Z. I hear him saying things to me about Mary Ann. I hear him saying things to me about Laura. I hear God speaking to me. And because I know that what we need to move forward in life is that word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I cannot sit still in his presence. Y'all know me. I'm excited. Because I know where God is faithful. He says, wherever two or three of you are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And someone says, but there are places that I have been that people were supposedly gathered in the name of God and I didn't feel the presence of God. Oh, 100% correct. But that doesn't mean the presence was not there. You just didn't feel it. Because sometimes it takes having other people plugging in for you to also have some power. Oh, you didn't hear what I just said. You see, <laughs> you may be standing to people that have disconnected themselves and their affection from the heart of God. If the person standing by your right, or by your left, and by your right are people who constitute a dielectric. Do we know what a dielectric is? An insulator. It's like if you have a wire that you plug into the wall and you wrap it with a duct tape. Maybe not duct tape, because some duct tapes can conduct electricity. Let's say you wrap it in, in, in gaff tape, which is cloth. You wrap it in gaff tape and you put it in the wall. Is it kind of power? No. Because the wire itself is a conductor, but it's surrounded by insulators that will keep it from engaging the power. That is the reason why we go to certain places, even though we are there in the name of God, and somebody standing over there is also in the name of God, we're immediately surrounded by people who are there in the name of money, who are there in the name of religion, who are there in the name of their own pleasure. If you are surrounded by such people, they constitute dielectric, they constitute insulation, and you may not feel the power because you are not in the company of those who are seeking the Lord. Hmm. The company that we keep is very important. And I needed to say that because I know that some of us, when you hear that wherever two or three are gathered in his name, God is there. You, you tend to remember those times that you have been disappointed because you didn't experience God, you didn't feel God. It wasn't because God stopped being faithful for that meeting or for, at that meeting. No, God is faithful all the time. It's just that sometimes we do not know how to court his presence. We do not know how to engage his presence. The Bible says the companionship of fools shall be destroyed. Why? Why will they be destroyed? Because destruction is, the, is, is death. It is the absence of the life of God and the splendor and the beauty of his holiness. You see, destruction is chaos, but the presence of God is described as beauty and it's described as beautifully holy. And so the reason why the companionship of fools is destroyed is because they intentionally disconnect from God for the fool says in his heart there is no God and so God after a while takes his presence and goes and the moment the beauty of that splendor is gone what you're left with is destruction and that is the reason why the Bible says do not be found in the midst of them it is never God when things are not working as promised it is usually other things because God is not a man that he should lie. And so I want us to have a renewal of hope in what it means to be in the presence of God. So now let me circle back to what I started saying. I talked to us about the fact that I know places that I have been and things that have been said to me. And I am always eager to share with us what is going on in the realm of the spirit, the things that I am picking up, the things that heaven is about to do, the things that we're about to see unfold upon the earth. And I have come to realize that sometimes 
we haven't created the capacity to receive more because we haven't done much with the last. The Bible says, he that is faithful in little, to him much shall be given. And so I had to repent again after that September 4th prophecy came forth and my brother was sending it to me. I had to repent, even though we posted it. I realized at that point in time that I never sent it to a single person. Can you believe that? And I'm supposed to be really passionate about this work. There is room for improvement. It wasn't until after my brother all the way from Nigeria sent it to me that I started sending it to people. And pretty much everybody that I sent it to, but one or two people who were too politically invested to see the sense and prophecy, responded back to me saying, wow, thank goodness for this insight. This is awesome. I wish I heard this. I wish I had known this. I wish more people knew this. I was a little excited at their response, but I felt bad also because I'm like, man, we could have done this a lot sooner. Do you know how many people have found themselves in arguments? And how many people have found themselves not just in arguments, but saying things about the ongoing war that does not even align with the will of God? People just speaking because everybody else is saying stuff. Do you know how many of our brothers and sisters who have been swept away by the consensus of opinion? Because they believe, oh, hey, all of these people can't be wrong. The, the people in the news can't be telling us fibs, really. Do, do you know how many people? And it, the onus is on us to continue to shine the light. So that at some point, some people who have been taken captive by Medea, the goddess of enchantment, which today is called Medea, Medea, can be set free. Because the captives have to be set free on your account and mine. The reason why we have received all of the privileges that we have is not so that we can have long titles and, and have only testimonies that have got to do with us, our families, and our church. The reason why we have received all of what we have received is so that we can see the captives set free. Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me with the Holy Spirit and with power. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, the opening of prison doors to them that are held captive. I know it can be hard sometimes, but communion house, we got a heads up for almost a month before that word came forth. The Lord told us, I want you to prophesy regardless of their faces, regardless of the posture that they take. The Lord took us to Jeremiah 17, 21 and reminded us that the men of Anathoth will do everything within their power to stop us from prophesying. Just because they want to intimidate us. And how are they intimidating us these days by making us feel like we're a minority, by making us feel that what we're saying is very different from what they have always believed. It doesn't matter how long you have believed what you have believed. If it is not the truth, let go of it very quickly and embrace the truth in the time that you have left. Religion is such a stronghold that many people aren't willing to shake themselves from it. The Pharisees, majority of them were older than Jesus. And when Jesus came, they're like, who is this young boy? Do you know how long we have believed the things that we believe? They said the same thing to John. John could see through them. John said, look, you, I know you guys have come here just to fulfill another religious show. He says, but until you bear the fruit of repentance, don't waste your time. We're not impressed by all your drama. The reality of it is that once people have started going in a particular direction, it is not easy for them to turn around. But let me tell you something. I am not married to any doctrine. I am not married to any opinion. I am only connected by faith to that which the heart of the Lord is saying per time. Many of us, we are too, and it's all pride. Come to think about it, it's pride. Cognitive dissonance is what the psychologists call it. Cognitive dissonance is when there is a notion within you that consistently resists a truth that is being introduced to you that is very contrary to what you consider to be the foundation of your civilization. It's called cognitive dissonance. But you know what I call it? Pride. All that long stuff is for the academia. Right here, we just call it pride. Because sometimes, you just don't want to believe that you're wrong and Manuelita is right. You know how people look at you sometimes and they think to themselves, how can I be wrong and you? You. You. They look at you and they look at you in turn with the eye of the world. 
You understand what I mean? People size you up from the perspective of the world. They earn more than you. They have more degrees than you. They're better politically connected than you. In fact, they have more people in their church than you. They drive a newer model of the car that you have been patching for all these years. And so from every ramification, they seem to be better than you. So how come it is you? But I tell you what, let me, say, let me say this. Anyone who is going to prophesy in this generation that we're in has to borrow from John the Baptist. Because there is a spirit of prophecy that is very much associated with the coming of the Lord Jesus. It is a forerunner spirit and is a spirit that apply, appears to be deprived. As long as we are still looking like we are rich in the things of the world, we are not ready to be the voices of him crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. And that is the reason why we've been so attacked. That is the reason why we've been robbed. That is the reason why we have been stripped. Simply because John the Baptist had nothing but camel skin. And he was eating wild locusts and honey. And he was in the wilderness. And he was in the Jordan. And if you know what the Jordan is, then you don't want to be found in the Jordan. Because the Jordan was never pretty. There was never a time wherein the Jordan was said to be beautiful. A man who was leprous, a general in the army of Syria, one of the most prominent persons in Damascus, he encountered the prophet of God, Elisha. And he knew because of the report that had reached his quarters that that man could pray for him for his leprosy to leave him and he still resisted getting baptized in the Jordan. And this was what he said. He said, are not Abana and Fapar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the rivers in Israel? He said, you're not even asking me to go to any one of these second class rivers to get baptized. You're asking me to go to the Jordan. He says, I'm not going. And Elisha was like that, you're not getting cleansed. Choose. But then after a while, he came to his senses. He was like, nevertheless, at your word. And when he went into the Jordan, God made sure that it wasn't an accident. You know, sometimes when God sees that you're recovering, proud soul, after you have even repented, it takes a while for you to start to see results because God wants to be sure that your repentance is genuine. So he dipped in the Jordan the first time nothing happened until the seventh time. The seventh time he dipped in that dirty water was when God was like, okay, 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 Naaman is serious. Name Give him a new skin. Give him new bodies. The reality of it is this. This man was in the Jordan and people did not care to extol whatever he was saying simply because he lacked what they call significance. The things that they have come to associate with significance, he lacked it. And Jesus told them again, after they were trying to consider whether they would listen to Jesus or not, he says, I see y'all are still trying to determine whether you want to listen to me or not. Because when you went to John, you were disappointed at his appearance. Jesus says you were expecting him, if he's truly a, a prophet from God, you were expecting him to be dressed in fine linen. To be, wear, to be draped in a beautiful apparel. And Jesus said to them, where has that ever happened? He said, are not the ones who are dressed in fine linen the ones you find in the palaces, the lobbies, the politicians who are there for your money and for their belly? They are the ones you find dressed nicely. He said, but this one is dressed the way his heavenly father wants him to dress. I say all of these things because of the fact that the things that I want to share with you require a little bit of preambling so that we can appropriate them correctly and receive them right firsthand. So this is what is going on. If we would prophesy, we have to borrow from John and be ready because the witnesses of the last days, every time Jesus is coming to the earth, there's always a forerunner movement. And the forerunner movement is always a prophetic movement. Okay? And when it's a prophetic movement, it has to be consistent with the prophetic movements that we have seen up until now. When salvation, because Jesus means God as salvation, right? Yeshua. 
When salvation came to the children of Israel, after they had been in captivity in Egypt, God sent them a prophet. And that prophet used to wear fine clothing. He used to be dressed in white linen. He used to sit in the courts of Pharaoh because he was raised as the prince of Egypt. God looked down and saw Moses looking like one of them and was like, he's not ready. We need to strip him of all of that. And so he had to go into captivity himself and was a fugitive for about 40 years before he was ready to deliver the message because God has chosen that his prophets have to look a certain way. And so by the time he showed up again, he wasn't looking pretty. In fact, the last, the last bit of decency that was in Moses, God took him before he entered Egypt. Remember that he was a shepherd and he took his wife and children and they were about to go as soon as God spoke to him and God roughed him up on the way. The Bible says, and the Lord God met with him along the way to kill him. Let me help the prophets that are in the house. When God calls you, it's not going to be all a bed of roses. It's not always going to be nice and dandy. There are days wherein you will wake up and because of your prophetic instinct, you will know that it is God himself that is against you. <laughs> but let me tell you something, because he's for you and not against you, when he seems to be against you, he's not against you, he's against something about you that is to go. The biggest challenge that we have is learning not to resist God. Just let him have his way. The, the Bible says God spoke to Moses. He said, Moses, 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 I need you to go to Egypt and do this and do that. And Moses was, Moses did not argue with God. Every question he asked, were to, he asked every question so that he can have clarity. He was okay with it from day one. So why did God meet with him to kill him along the way? Because he was still too composed. He was still, there was an element of himself in himself. And when God met with him to kill him, just imagine, let me tell you something. Sometimes you have had a flu that nearly killed you. And you were afraid. Some people had COVID and they were so afraid. Some people were in car accidents and they were so afraid because they thought it was going to kill them. All those things are nothing. When God Almighty himself is the one that shows up to do the killing, it is a different kind of fear. The Bible says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hand of God Almighty. So imagine Moses left that experience with zero confidence in himself. Everything was gone. He was empty and ready for the master's use. So I want to encourage you because there are people here that the Lord has called to the office of a prophet. And God has called you, maybe even not to the office of a prophet, maybe it's just to the prophet. You might be a seer. And you might just be one of those people that will prophesy because of how in tune you are to the Spirit of God. But whatever it is, anything prophetic, you have to learn how to let go of the world. You have to let go of things. You have to let go of friends. I mean, there were times where certain people walked out of my life that I had considered friends. And I was so heartbroken because I'm like, so who am I going to talk to about this stuff? Who is going to do this stuff with me? And every single time that I have asked that question and allowed myself to listen, the Lord always says, I, I am. Because he's a very present help in time of need. He is that friend that sticks closer than a brother. But let me tell you something, you don't find his friendship until you are willing and ready to let go completely of the ones that you chose because he chose you all right so we're getting there little by little and we're about to get there so let me show you a prophecy in romans chapter 13. and then i'm going to quickly finish what i was saying about the prophecy of september 4th touch a little bit more on being in god's presence and then we're going to wrap it up Romans chapter 13 verse 2, the Bible says, therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. 
we are stepping into, you see, the battle, you know, I told you on the 4th of September that I saw a principality. And I know it's a principality because I had seen one like it in the time of the election of 2020. Just before the election, I saw a principality, a being that looked human, but also transhuman. She looked or he looked like what human beings will be if everything about them were perfect. If they were exactly symmetrical, this person could have been a droid. If you know what I mean, like this is almost artificial kind of beauty. And you couldn't tell if it was a male or a female. And that was the first time that I would recall seeing a being like that. And that being was meddling with the elections. Because he had called and summoned one of the governors. And he told the governor that if you would help us, we have a place for you. And they pointed to a place that looked like the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. When are people ever going to learn? Even me, who was in the vision, when I saw it, I was like, this is temptation. Because this looked like what Lot saw. Because the Bible says that Lot looked down and he saw the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. And that was what they were promising this fellow. And I'm like, this is why you need to know the word of God. Because if that governor had known the word of God, he should have known that the life after this one, the residents of the ones who are the inheritors and the co-heirs with Christ Jesus will not be on the lowlands. The Bible says that we will have are mountains upon the mountain of the Lord. That the children of God, the princes of Zion, they will live in mountains upon the mountain of God. And so if they're promising you, asking you to help them to speed up their plan so that they can give you an inheritance in the lowlands, you should have immediately known that that could not be of God. <laughs> you see, when God says, do not let... This book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate upon it day and night. It's not because when you study the word of God, God gets be to become more God. Well, technically, he becomes more God in your life. You understand? And in your situations. But the reality of it is that it is primarily for you so that you can operate at the level that he wants to deal with you at. You know, the reason why God is asking us to pay attention, this is what I said I was going to say about being in God's presence. The reason why God wants you to learn how to be in his presence is because of the fact that God does not need to speak to you louder than he is already speaking. In fact, you don't want God to speak to you louder. You know why? Dear, I see the way you did your mouth. The Bible says that his voice is already like thunder upon many waters. You have lightning and thunder upon just your house, one roof. And you're shaking and your dog is barking like it's going to lose his mind. Now imagine thunder that is powerful enough to cover many waters. That's what it means when the Bible says the voice of the Lord is like thunder upon many waters. It's not just one thunder that is in an area. You know sometimes there is thunder here and the people in Mobile, Alabama may not even know that anything is going on. But the Bible says, and when the Bible talks about waters, waters represent regions because different regions have different waters because the people that received that prophecy were people who lived in desert areas and they all clustered around the oases around a particular body of water. So when you see the Bible talk about many waters, it's talking about many lands, many regions, many boundaries, because the boundaries were essentially marked by water. This is our water, and we're going to build a city around it. Go find your own water. And you see different waters, different oases. You understand what I mean? And so it's talking about the fact that a particular thunder that is so boisterous that many nations will hear it at the same time. That is the way the voice of God is. So why would you want him to speak any louder? If anything at all, maybe you want him to speak softer. You see? But the reality of it is this. It is not the voice of God that needs to be louder for it to be clearer. It is actually other sounds that you have learned to pay attention to that need to be silenced. If you have a transistor radio in this place and you want to tune into the fish, you understand what I mean? You don't call them first of all and say, is that the fish? Ready? Can you please increase your signal? Because I want to I wanna listen to some music. You see, you don't tell them to increase. What you do is you decrease the noise around your radio by tuning out every other frequency and leaving just the one. 
And that is what happens when you spend time in the presence of God. Many people gave up on spending time in the presence of God because after one week, they're not speaking in tongues like Moses and Anderson. And they're like, yeah, this thing is not working. I think, I don't know what that Nigerian does. I don't know. But the reality of it is, I can tell you what he did. Because it is not a secret. The Bible says your senses are sharpened by reason of use. I have had months wherein I couldn't read more than just Genesis chapter 1. Because everything was just confusing to me. I'll put it aside and come back again. Months. The first time I read the entire New Testament, you don't even want to know how long it took me. Because I would start and I would forget where I was. I would start and everything would be confusing. And that is even the New Testament. That is literally straightforward. Except for Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1 is still like the Old Testament. It started with genealogies. And I used to skip those genealogies until one day the Holy Spirit told me, he asked me, what are you doing? He said, I'm making my life easy. <laughs> what does it look like? And he was like, okay. And then he stepped aside and I fell asleep. And when I fell asleep, I was in the vision. And in the vision, I saw a house that had holes in the wall. And I was there criticizing the builder. And he was like, oh, you're wondering what happened here. And then he took me back to a couple of days before what I was seeing, and I was the laborer. In the vision, I was the one bringing brick. He was the builder. I was bringing brick. And I noticed when he showed me what was going on that I left certain brick, I didn't pick them up. And he was like, I build with what you bring. All those genealogies that you were leaving behind, they are the holes in your wall. He said, every scripture was inspired by me. The Bible says all scripture was given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Every single one of them, including those names, those long names that you and I cannot pronounce. I only make it sound like I know how to pronounce it because I have the microphone. When you examine the way that I pronounce it, it may not be the way the people who answer those names pronounced it, you know? So don't be deceived because sometimes you feel bad when men of God open the Bible and they're like, and the Lord said unto Mephibosheth. And you're like, oh my God, if I can just say it like that. That is not how it is said. He's just making it sound fancy. So neither you nor I know how to pronounce those names and we will just skip over them. And when I walk out from that dream, from the vision, I woke up back to life. I was like, okay. So guess what I went to? I went to the book of Chronicles. I threw myself into the deep end. Because up until that time, we used the book of Chronicles to sleep. If you couldn't sleep, go to Second Chronicles. You will sleep quickly. That is the level of boring that that thing is to the man who is in the flesh. But the moment you begin to awake to the consciousness of you, who you are in that dimension of the living waters, even chronicles will sound better to you like the poetry of Aristotle, simply because of the fact that when your spirit comes to life, things of the spirit begin to make sense. But it doesn't happen overnight. I'm encouraging you, don't give up on God's presence. There are things that God wants to deliver to us concerning what's about to happen on earth. You know, I've told you before, these days that we're in, time is being sped up. And so things are happening very quickly. And that is the reason why heaven is also speaking very quickly. Do you know that it got to a time wherein John, the beloved, after all the prophecies, all of the visions that they were showing to him, he came to a conclusion that the spirit of the Lord speaks expressly. He was like, God's Holy Spirit doesn't walk about. Because I'm here and it's like, so it was like the spirit speaks expressly. Nobody gave him a heads up. He was an old man of about 90 years old. They couldn't kill him, so they threw him out onto the island of Patmos. Imagine how much beating the man had received. And then the Holy Spirit came and he was speaking so quickly. And the guy was like, whoa, the spirit speaks expressly. So we got a heads up that it was coming, that these times are coming. Visions are sporadic these days. If you would pay attention to see, you would see what the Lord is doing. There is more that God wants to give to you. 
God wants to begin to reveal things to you and I simply because we have assignments that have to be carried out very expeditiously. God is about to start sending you to specific people. God is about to start leading you to stand in specific places and you don't even need to know why. He's just going to tell you, get up, do this, and just do it. And before you know what's going on, you will find someone is going to walk by and the Lord will say, now deliver it. You know, there are times when the Lord has said to me to deliver it and I was about to say, uh, what? Do I deliver? Because I don't recall when you gave me anything for that person. You understand what I mean? But when the Lord says deliver it, he says open your mouth and I will fill it. When he says deliver it, he already knows that he has it in you. But there are times when God does not even let you know what you're about to deliver until you deliver it because he knows the state of your own mind. Because if he lets you know, you're like, oh, I don't think I want to deliver that word to that person. She owes me five bucks. We, I, you see, that was what happened to Jonathan. I mean, to Jonah. Jonah was like, the people of Nineveh, this is your plan for them, forget it. They, they don't, they're not worthy of what you are asking me to give to them. And God was like, both you and them, you belong to me. The word that is in your mouth is from me. So what exactly is your problem? Even your transport fare, I'm paying for it. So anyway, story for another day, but God is asking you to be strategically positioned. In case y'all did not notice, I'm wearing a brand new pair of shoes. It's one of my birthday presents. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah, you know how it is. I've been, I've been doing this all day. I nearly fell down to get attention. Nobody noticed. I was expecting, I was expecting for people to nudge each other and say, are those new? And nobody did anything. Everyone was just focused on the word of life. How dare you? But talking about the shoes, the size my wife got for me was the right size. But once she delivered it to me, I was in the flesh. So I tried it and I was like, yeah, it doesn't feel right. This and that. She was like, you want to change it? Go change it. I mean, the woman of God already knew. So I went, I went to change the shoe. And then I chose the one that I thought was my size and then I couldn't move. And I was like, wow, the woman of the Lord is in the spirit. The man of God needs to catch up. So I told them to give me the one that I brought. You know, when the shame is so apparent that you actually just wear it with pride, I, I was like, just give me the one. Yeah. Because initially, you know what I said to the man when, who was attending to me? I said, oh, my wife got me these uh, pair of shoes and they, they're not my size, so I think it's better I come in person. And the guy was like, oh, absolutely. You see, whenever a man is doing a thing by himself and he uses the word better, he's already in the wrong. Because God says it is not even good for a man to be alone. So how can you by yourself attain better? So when I told him, I said it was better for me to be here by myself, he turned out to be that it was not even good for me to show up there at all. But what I really want to bring out was when I was going there, I noticed that all of the attend, all of what do they call them, the attendants, were at the back side of the store. Nobody was in the front side of the store. And the Holy Spirit said to me, he says, go to the right and stay there. And I looked at the right. All the shoes there were very different from this one. I looked to the left and the far back. I saw shoes that looked like this. And that was where all the attendants were congregating. So I decided to go to the left and walk as I was going all the way to the back. You know what I noticed? Where he told me to go to, there was a shelf of shoes and a man was behind it. And he was the one with the key to the store. So as soon as I went all this way, the Holy Spirit said to me, this is why I told you to go there. And then I saw the man and he turned around and he went to stand exactly where the Lord asked me to stand. I was like, I'm sorry. And I dragged myself back to where I was told to stand. And the guy was just there waiting for me. I didn't have any business going to the back of the store. He wanted it to be easy for me. He wanted it to be quick because the time is short. But all that rigmarole is what we subject ourselves to when we don't listen to the voice of the good shepherd. He says whether you turn to the left or to the right, you will hear a voice telling you this is the way. When I had that experience, I was like, thank you. I think I know also what you are saying. What the Holy Spirit is letting us know is that we have come to such a time wherein he may not explain all the details. He may not give you all of the nitty gritty, but he will just tell you what you must do. If I had just stood there, it would have been a quick walk of righteousness. So I want to encourage you 
that there is a lot that God wants to do through you and I, but he needs our obedience and he needs for us to be able to just go where he leads without asking questions. And when you get there, you will see the plan of God unfold. So let me connect all the four or five things that I have said. I've said more than that, but some of the key points is this. We need to do something about what God has already given to us. Even though the Lord may not have prophesied through you, he's prophesied through somebody else. Share the word. Let other people know so that we're not digging people out of the dirt. If they have the word before the war begins, they will not take the wrong side or take sides at all. Neither will they utter things from their mouths that are against the will of God. Because in these last days, many will say there is a casting down. But you need to remain of the company of those who say there is a lifting up. Because the Bible says that those who know their God shall be strong and they shall do exploit. How do you know the people who know their God? They will speak that which is the mind of God regardless of what the situation stipulates. So it is important and imperative for us to get the word out. To let somebody know, this is what the Lord has revealed through the man of God. This is what the Lord has revealed through my friend, my brother, my sister, my wife. This is what the Holy Spirit is saying unto the ecclesia about the events of the world. It may not happen next week. It may take a month. It may take six months. But eventually you would see it happen and you would have done your part in a timely fashion. And then I said to you that I've been in places wherein... So many things are unfolding in the realm of the spirit. I see angels being handed scrolls to deliver to the sons of men so that we are not ignorant of what the Lord is doing. Neither do we miss our seasons. And the reason why many of us are unable to keep up with the delivery of the prophetic is because we have not even spent enough time in his presence to understand the routine of the supernatural. It is not too late to commit yourself to the presence of God. It is not too late to suspend certain habits. Some of us may have to suspend our following or followership of a particular football club for a whole season. You will not die but live. A whole season is not going to kill you. It's only going to make you stronger. Simply because there is a price to pay and it is not money. The Bible says through the ministry of Isaiah, come and buy you who have no money. What God is dishing out is not money. Simon the sorcerer offered money for the power of the Holy Spirit. And Peter said to him, your money perish with you. As long as you think unrepentant as you are, you will not have a part in this kingdom. The currency for obtaining power is not money. It is attention. It is dedication. We need to learn how to hear the voice of God. We need to put a premium on the voice of God. We need to put a premium on the ministry of angels. We need to put a premium on the side that we are supposed to be in. Uh, 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 we need to put a premium into the side that we're supposed to be on. We're supposed to be on the Lord's side and we need to make investments. And it's not too late. I know the time is short. Things are happening very quickly on the earth. Sporadically even. But guess what? You can still choose to pay attention to what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. It is not too late. Some things have to go. And then I told us about the ministry of David. My wife is like, why do you summarize? We have the video. We can watch it again. But let me summarize it so when you're watching it, you hear it three times. The ministry of David exists as a model for us to see what it means for a man to be so conversant with the presence of God to the point wherein he hears the conversation of the ancient. ancient. Do you know that everything that is happening in the world, everything that was prophesied that will happen, will happen through the ministry of angels, whether good or bad? Have you thought about it? The plagues, they're not going to happen in the hand of demons. They will happen by angels. The destruction, they will happen by angels. A lot of what is going to be perpetrated by the Antichrist and the false prophet, a lot of those things are being poured out by the hand of the angels. And so if you are not familiar with the ministry of the ancient, how do you even know what they're telling you they want to do? The reason why I told you about the principality and I told you that that principality, I couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman, is because there is an order of spiritual beings that look like that. And that was the same kind of being that I saw on the craft on this fighter plane, on this fighter jet, who was giving instructions for there to be an attack on another ship that looked like the one that he or she was in. And the reason was because they needed to let me know that the forces behind this war are spiritual forces fulfilling prophecy. 
What you're seeing, I told you, I explained to you that it is Acts chapter 4, verse 26 to 30 that has been fulfilled. That the Lord has proposed certain things to happen. And he also revealed it through Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 9, 11. 9, 11 so that you don't forget. And so I tell you all of these things, but what do we do when we receive these things? Two things. Spread the word. Second thing, be more attentive. Because the Lord has not chosen to speak through only one man. He says, will I do a thing without revealing it to my servants, the prophets? It is plural. You can see too, the Lord wants you to. But it takes you fine-tuning your senses. And then, lastly, I read to us from Romans chapter 13, verse 2. That says, therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will he bring to judgment. The Lord just said to borrow this snippet. To drive home the point that whenever the Lord speaks to you, do not resist. When he's leading you to go, the Bible says, do not lean on your own understanding. I was looking and I'm like, the attendants are in the back. But the Lord is telling me to stand here. I'm like, maybe I'm not hearing right. Please. Before you doubt the Lord, doubt everything else and believe in the Lord. I say this because he's taking you to places. All righty, we're going to break bread and I'm going to give to you one more thing and then we, we, we will take the offerings and the announcements and, and wrap up. Hmm. Father, we worship your holy name. You see, I don't believe in coincidences. I know that that song that I came into today was Bring Out the Well. The well is there. But many of us do not know how to draw from the well. Many of us, we kind of know how to draw from the well, but we have not even drawn enough for ourselves, stock less of being able to feed other people. But God is raising up Moseses in the house in this season that are able to draw the well, not just for themselves, for others, even for animals. There's about to be plenty of water. Revelation, insight, inspiration. The Bible says, and I will read to you from Exodus chapter 2 verse 19. And they said, an Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds. And he also drew enough water for us and watered the flock. I want you to say over yourself today as we break bread, this is my seizing of enough water. I will be used by the Lord to draw water enough. Please, let me encourage you. You see, this is not me. This is the word of the Lord. And so when the word of the Lord is telling you that you're about to draw water enough, I will do what Alan did. I will receive it with joy. Because the Bible says, faithful is he who was promised, who will also do it. Do you know what's interesting about the story that we just read? The man who drew the water was a man who just days before nearly died of thirst. But when the moment of deliverance comes, even the one who has been in need and in lack will be instrumental to plenty. You may be saying, even me, I need a word for my finances. I need a word for my relationships. I need a word. I need, to be, I need to be able to understand the dreams that even I am having. The Lord is saying, you have been too focused on yourself. You are an agent of abundance. Don't be obsessed with lack. Divorce yourself from the mentality of lack. The reason why you lacked and you didn't have is not because I didn't have to give to you. It's because I was shaping your value system. Because Moses was called an Egyptian, because when they looked at him, he still looked like an Egyptian. Many of us, the reason why we've had to go through all of that is because we still look too much like the world. Your value system, the things that matter to you. Do you know some people will not come here because 
we're not sophisticated enough, worldly thinking. Some people will, are not able to receive from us because our packaging is it, what we're dishing out here. We're not putting it into a book and say 150 prayer points for the prophetic. You know, so just because we're not doing that, they think maybe these people don't have anything good. My wife and I do marriage conferences, maybe, what do you call those things? Uh, counseling. And some people are like, mm, it can't be good because we're not charging money for it. And that's because in the world, they think in money. And the Lord says, I've allowed you to go through all of that so that you will be confident in things that are of more value than money. Because you are about to draw water enough. Anyway, praise the Lord. So we're going to break bread today. Do we all have the bread and the wine? And I always encourage people at Communion House, and I'm going to tell some of our new people, we don't believe that anything has to be done before you take the body and the blood of Jesus simply because that body and blood of Jesus is what qualifies us to be in him in the first place. While we were yet, yet sinners, what did he give to us? His body. He says, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood poured out for you. And that was what gave us salvation. He told the, the multitude, he said, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have a part in him. And he said to his disciples, you see that flesh that I was talking about? This bread is that flesh. This wine is that blood. So that you're not, you don't have to eat me. I'm giving you a symbolism. But it's the act of obedience that unleashes the potential. So as you eat of the Lord's body today, you eat unto life and not unto condemnation. As you drink of the Lord's blood today, symbolized by the wine that is in this cup, you drink unto life, unto acceptance, unto mercy, unto grace. And I say to you all that as we eat of the Lord's body today and drink of his blood, we do so unto the fulfillment of promise that even we will draw water enough for others. Inspiration. Speaking by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Delivering understanding of scripture and the mind of God for the season. For the situation. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you because you are sending us forth from here. Unleashing us unto darkness. So that darkness will cease to be in the places of our assignment. Because we are light and when that light that we are shines forth in the dark, the darkness cannot comprehend it. Communion house, out from your bellies shall flow the rivers of living water. No flesh, no doubt, no tradition of men, no ideologies that limit the working of the spirit will get in the way of your flow. It will flow. You will prophesy. You will speak in unknown tongues. You will interpret tongues. You will speak scriptures that you have once heard before, but without even you remembering in your brain, your heart will spew it forth because the time has come for you to draw water enough. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink his blood in remembrance of him. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Alrighty, I'm going to leave you with one more scripture. It's Mark 5, 7 or 7, 5. We're about to find out. Um, let's first of all go to 5, 7. And let's see if it's the one. Mark chapter 5, verse 7. No, it's Mark chapter 7, verse 5. Mm. Yeah, there, there it is. The Bible says, Then the Pharisees and the scribes, and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? They asked and say, why are the disciples not walking according to the tradition of the elders? I wanted to give the scripture to you because in the beginning I was telling you about the fact that for us to be effective in the prophetic ministry, in the times that we're in, we have to do things differently. Okay? So we have to be okay 
with breaking away with religious traditions simply because we are no longer led by the liturgies of men, but we are led by the Holy Spirit. Let your feet be light on the ground so that you can move where the Holy Spirit is leading. Communion House, I know that some of y'all are saying, pray for us. I, I was about to step down and then I heard that and said, pray for us. Brother Cody, I, I, I got mine. Thank you. So I'm just going to pray for uh, a small group of people very quickly because of the hour that has come. So the Lord said to me to quickly tell you that the moment they come out denying what just happened, they are the ones who did it. So they're going to, a group of people, they may have one representative because I see just one person, but I know that he was sent forth by another group of people. I can even describe to you what they were, but I don't want to stare any pot today, but a man will come out representing another group. And they would deny something in the news. They would deny, they would like, they would say, no, we didn't do it. We're not aware of it. We didn't do it. We're hearing it also for the first time. We didn't do it. The Lord says that is a mark. The moment they deny it, you know it's them. Because they're of their father, the devil. They are liars. Okay? And why is that important? It is important because there are certain people that will not believe you until they know that you hear from God that clearly. So you will say it for some people to hear and say, these people denying it, they're the ones. And they'll be like, no, they cannot be the ones. We trust them. They're, they're people of authority and this and that. Don't argue with them. Just tell them what you've said and go your way. Many days later, they will come to you and say, the Lord is with you. We have now found out that they were the ones. Okay? So just be on the lookout. The small group of people that I want to pray for are people who have been pregnant for a while. And you know that it's time for you to give birth. In fact, some, some part of you tells you that you're long overdue. There are certain things that you have been pregnant with and you're like, how much longer will it be before I see this thing? The midwives are here. And I want to pray for just a handful of people who say that there is a, a solution that is long overdue. There, there is a project, there is a, an opportunity. You, you know what it is that should have been delivered a long time ago. But then it's just like a blessing that has been hanging. The midwives are here today. I want to pray with you if you want to come forward real quick. I'm just going to lay my hands on you. I know some people still have an hour drive, 90 minute drive. So for their sake, we would not be long. The only instruction that I have received so far for y'all with your long overdue miracles is this. I have heard the midwives and they said, just tell them to listen to us. When they say push, you push. The instructions are about to come forth. Very clear, but let me tell you something about those instructions. You would not like the way they will sound because of your pain. Because of, the, because of how eager you are and because your body is ready, your spiritual body is ready to deliver those things. Because of those things, you will not like the way they sound. They may sound harsh. They may sound short. But let me tell you something. Do not be in the flesh. Be in the spirit. So that you do not fulfill the loss of the flesh. The loss of the flesh will delay the delivery. But obedience in the spirit will bring forth the miracle. And so I want you to say, speak. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. And then you need to personalize it and say, speak, Lord. I am listening. Help me to do that which you say. I will do that which you say. In the mighty name of Jesus. And so hear me, O midwives of the Lord and the angels on assignment, ministering spirits to these ones who are heirs of salvation. By the words of their mouths, they have opened their hearts to you to say that whatever the Father says, we will do. 
as you bring them the word of the Father for deliverance and for delivery, they will do as you say, and there shall be delivery. The word of the Lord says, there shall be a performance. There shall be a performance. Men are being instructed to pick up their pen to act in your favor. Doors are being commanded to open unto you. And then even you have been instructed to arise. Because for some of us, the doors have been opened. We have just not arisen. Your delivery is now and all that which needs to be aligned is being aligned. Oh, it is done. I saw one of the midwives put a jar back on the shelf. I was like, are you getting it? No, she says, I'm putting it back because we're done. Father, I thank you because these tongues will testify of your goodness. And Lord, we will see fruits, Holy Ghost. Father, I thank you. Things are getting better. Things are getting better. For the Lord is on the throne. Things are getting better. Things are getting better. Things are getting better. And some of us, I'm telling you, uh, th that was the song that I was hearing. Is a song we used to sing way back when in Nigeria. You see, because the Lord is on the throne. And what that means is you have allowed the Lord to be king in your life. Because where the word of the king is, there is power. You are saying, whatever you say, I will do it. And you, you just do it. And there will be delivery in the name of Jesus. God bless you. You may be seated. Alan. <laughs> ah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Oh, God is good. Uh, I thought I was done. But one more thing. See, there's this thing in Romans chapter 7 verse 14. That somebody needs to take with them today. The Bible says in Romans chapter 7 verse 14. It says, for we know that the law is spiritual. But I am carnal. Sold under sin. I want to remind you of the scripture that I read to you a couple of weeks ago that the ones who are captives in exile are eager to be set free. Someone here is saying, but I have been trying to do these things, but I've just not been able to. I've been trying to lean more into the presence of God, spend more time there, obey the word more, trust the word more, but I just find myself panicking and worrying, and I'm just, I just can't wait to be a better believer than I've been. The Lord is saying, it's not going to happen by your anxiety. This thing is spiritual, but you are carnal. And so the Lord is saying, let your spirit handle that which is spiritual. Just take a deep breath and say, Lord, I know you are in control. And you are the one who will do that which you have promised. I am not in a hurry. I would let you have your way in me. Because I know you're forming me into a better person into another man, into the man or the woman that is able to go out and do that which you have assigned. I choose patience today. I choose confidence in you today and not in me. And as you say all of that in your heart, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ rest mightily upon you. And may you be renewed in your heart concerning the understanding that you have of the love of God so that you're able to accept that love and not worry. And let the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit also, let the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Now and always, in Jesus' name. But remember, your spirit is able even when your flesh is not. Trust his process. He will see you through. God bless you. As the man of God reminded us today, understanding how to tune into the right frequency to tap into the Holy Spirit is everything. And just getting that reminder, you know, sometimes the word will cut you in a way that, that you just know it was meant for you. 
And I, I think I can attest that everybody felt that, uh, that message the right way. So let's make our uh, eyes up to the screen for the tithes and offering details, the giving details. Um, we've got Cash App, uh, Communion House, dollar sign Communion House. Then we've got our Zelle and PayPal information that should be on the screen. Just waiting for it to load patiently here. All right, there it is. So we've now got the d given details on the screen, and Brother Kenyatta also has. All right, and moving right along here, we've got our family teaching and dinner this coming Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. So looking forward to seeing you all there. And then up next, make sure we tapped in on Wednesday at the At Communion House on Instagram for our second watch prayer. Uh, pastor has again called us all to be there and show up. So I'm looking forward to seeing everybody tapping in to catch that word. So I'm gonna get the mic over to Brother Allen now. Thank you, brother. God is good. Hallelujah. With our tithes prepared, we'll go ahead and lift up the offering. Father, we give you praise for this night of your word, O oh God, of impartation, of stirring up, of delivery. Lord, as you have ordered our footsteps here, as you have granted unto us seed to sow, for your word declares that you do that. Lord, let these offerings unto you be found pleasing. Lord, as we pour into this house, this fertile ground, the man and woman of God that you have set before us, our brothers and sisters, as we look at either side of us, that you grow day by day, moment by moment, as we spend time together in your presence, let these offerings be sweet smelling. We declare that all glory and honor belong to you. And we all said, Amen. Hallelujah. God is good. Let's celebrate the Lord. <laughs> God is good. Look, I'm so thankful to have a mommy in the house. Gavin, would you help us? Come on, somebody. Y'all not hype enough. I told y'all earlier... Worship felt like the pregame. You see, we had such an opportunity to just, I believe, get a glimpse into what the Lord has laid upon the heart of the man of God for going into November. Uh, many of us that have been a part uh, of Chameleon House these past couple of years, we've had the opportunity to have nights of prayer, uh, meetings, just pressing into the things of God where we just come together praying in the Holy Ghost, declaring scriptures into the next year, a number of things. And for this meeting in particular, I want us to dial into inviting others. And even for ourselves, because how many remember that a little while ago, the instruction that we received was to pray now so we wouldn't have to later. And what did that mean? To pray now when we had the opportunity to really spend time, make time, versus when those times would come when we knew we'd be getting pressed and pulled on every side. Let this be a meeting for us to dial in again, to turn ourselves up, to crank up the flame. You see, we're gonna have an awesome time of declarations, of praying in the Holy Ghost, uh, and even others that you know may have been seeking the Lord concerning praying in the Holy Ghost, where that gifting has not yet manifested. This is a meeting that they need to be a part of where we can touch and agree with them, amen? God is good. You'll see this flyer public in just a bit. That way you'll be able to share it with others, invite. We want to pack this place out and be on fire for the Lord. You don't want to miss this. Amen. God is good. Here's the woman of God. Praise God. You know, um, this meeting is not because we want to pack this place, but this is a meeting of the Lord. I was there when the Holy Spirit started speaking to pastor about this. It's not gonna be this regular meeting that we do on Saturdays. I know 
um, when we come here, is what the Lord told us before we started coming on us. Every time you meet, my presence, my glory will be there at every meeting. Amen? But when the Lord now even say, no slumber November, right? Remember, you already promised us that is one level. And now he's giving us another day and say, meet me November 4th. When the Lord say, meet me, what do you want to do? You want to run there. And you just don't want to run there. You want to bring people with you. Amen? And one thing the Lord told me when I was praying about this, the Lord said, last year, we had revival. Remember when the Lord said, I want to revive you. I want to revive you guys. And with that, when we had many testimonies come, from that revived meeting that we had. I think it was an all-night meeting, and it was termed revived. And the Lord revived us. And I think also it was in November or something. If you remember, if you know, that's when Kenyatta got pregnant. Amen? <laughs> and so many testimonies. And the, um, she, she always shared that. That was at the meeting that the Lord... What she was not even expecting, all right? And so when the Lord says, revive, it did revive. And then now he's giving us a word and saying, no slumber November. This is for a reason, amen? And so I'm just here just to encourage you guys to please come out. Don't miss it for anything. Clear your calendar. If you're visiting us for the first time, welcome to Communion House of Prayers. Amen. The Lord of God says, my house shall be called a house of prayers. And so many a times we have seen how we Christians, we haven't been praying and we have seen what's happened to us. Amen. And so I want us to just jump on our feet and say, I'm coming. I'm not going to miss this meeting. Make a commitment and say, I'm coming. I'm coming and I'm bringing people with me. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hey, y'all have heard it. Everyone have a blessed night.